Hey everyone, welcome to another Facebook Live. My name is Jeff Palmer. I'm the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. Today we're going to be talking about a very important subject, bone health. Um, and we know that exercise does improve bone health. But a recent study just came out actually looking at the differences between omnivores and those eating a plant-based diet, uh, specifically vegans. So anytime there's a study that is showing the differences between vegans, I like to take a look at it because sometimes it has valuable information for us. But before we get into it, let me get the disclaimer going. This video is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Okay, so the name of the study, let me go ahead and uh, copy it and put it with the link as always. So oh, my format is that I will always uh, put into the comments section uh, every study that I talk about. Also, uh, I will put it up on the screen so that you can see both the study and the link. And boom, there it is right there for you. Um, so this is a uh, uh, actually pretty recent study. This was uh, published in August of this year um in uh, august 4th so actually just last week so this is only a week old from its published date in the journal of clinical endocrinology and metabolism okay so the title of the study is uh, right on the screen therefore you self-reported resistance training is associated with better and you can see that at the hrp qct derived bone bone micro architecture in vegan people Okay, so what is uh, bone ar micro architecture? Well, kind of a little, little bit what it sounds like is micro meaning small, architecture meaning the web work that goes in, inside the bones. Um, some of this is due to what's called osteocalcin. You should check out my previous video on um, vitamin K2. Uh, which helps stimulate the production of osteocalcin in our bones. So when you think of bones, most people think of bones as a solid thing. But if you actually break a bone and you look inside, you'll see a bunch of webbing. And it's that webbing or lattice work that actually gives it its strength, the bone strength. Because a bone can snap pretty easily uh, if it doesn't have this micro architecture in it. And that's what we want to be concerned with when we are talking about bone strength. Um, so when you look at osteoporosis or osteopenia, this is where some of that architecture starts to dissolve and give way and you don't have as much of that web work or lattice work inside of the bone, which gives it its strength, which makes bone more brittle, easy to break. And that's where you can get into problems. So microarchitecture is a pretty important piece of bone strength. Now, we know that weight-bearing strength, uh, weight-bearing exercises, resistance training, uh, specifically with weights or high resistance, will strengthen bones. Now, why is that? So let's look at the evolutionary process a little bit. So all life sprang from the ocean. If you look at it from the evolutionary standpoint of view, life began in the oceans. And as the uh, the creatures evolved, it started out with uh, crustaceans, which are have all their bone architecture on the outside of the body. And this made a lot of sense because it gave the structure to the animal, but it also secondary as protection, right? But it has a drawback. It, the sensitivity wasn't there because it's bone, right? So you didn't have as much sensitivity. So as animals evolved to the land state, two things happen. One, they needed more of that structure because we had more weight. We had bigger size, right? And that bigger size, well, with the exception of whales, which were actually fish or what they call bony fish and, and, and whales, these had uh, larger bone structures and their bones actually went internal. This gives the structure more strength. But remember, in even a whale floating in water doesn't have the same gravitational effect. We know this from astronauts. When we put astronauts, human beings, in space where we remove them from the downward pressure of gravity, their bones react by saying, well, if there's no downward pressure, there's no pressure coming onto the bone structure, 
then we must not need it. And our body actually starts to break down and dissolve our bones. We get serious uh, osteoporosis just by being in space for a prolonged period when there is no artificial gravity. So this is a problem for ast astronauts uh, going long distances in space where there is no gravity. That is why our bodies have adjusted to the gravity of this planet and have bone structure in it. So it's the resistance, it's the pulling down of gravity that actually gives cause to our bone. If we remove the gravity, our bones just basically dissolve into nothing, go to mush. So we need that resistance. Now we know that using additional weight into our own, own body weight, we create stronger and stronger bones. That's because our body is reacting to the weight by putting more bone structure in there so it can handle the weight. And the weight is just different, a, a different way of saying gravitational effect. <laughs> so weight, the more weight you have, the more gravity can affect on it and the more downward pull. That downward pull shows up on your scale. The more weight you carry, the more size you carry, the more downward pull gravity has on you and therefore it presses down on the scale and shows you more weight. So that's it. So bones are a response to weight and gravity. All right. So why is that important with exercise? Because when you're doing exercise, when you're bearing additional weight, whether you're doing squats or even pulling on the things, you're putting more stress or pressure or weight bearing on that bone. And then the body reacts by sending more calcium to storage for that. Bones are typically uh, serve as another function, which is basically a storehouse for calcium so that we can use it for other persons purposes in the body, just like our body fat is a storehouse of extra calories that we can use at our leisure or use for things. Our body stores all kinds of materials. It stores vitamin K2, it stores omega-3s, it stores even amino acids to some degree. It actually pools amino acids in the interstitial tissues. So our body hangs on to things that it needs for a while, Vitamin A is another one, stores it in the skin. So our body is storing a lot of nutrients. Some it doesn't do so much uh, storage as well because our body is used to getting a plentiful source of it at the time. So it says, well, then I don't need to store them. But anything that is really vitally important, like omega-3s, the body can store in the body in the fat tissues, liver tissues, brain tissues. Check out my video on omega-3 to find out more about how the body actually can store enough omega-3s for many, many years. Same with vitamin B12. You can actually store enough vitamin B12 for 10 years or more by some uh, estimates. Okay, so let's get back to this study. So what is this study talking about with bone structure? So this is really important because a lot of people will think, oh, wait, I'm, I'm vegan or doing a healthy plant-based diet. I'm eating all these plant nutrients. Uh, I don't need to work out. I'm healthy. I like being lean. I don't need muscle. That's not important to me. But your bone health may suffer because of that, even with a healthy diet. That's why exercise is so important. That's why resistance training exercise or load bearing exercise is so important. And I want to stress this because this study points it out really well. Now, there are some limitations to the study. One, it's an observational study. So they're just looking at people. They aren't looking at the mechanisms, actions. They're not really pulling any things. Uh, they are measuring the amount of bone density in, in microarchitecture between the two groups. And they looked at vegans and they looked at omnivores. And they looked at it over... Um, a period of time, six months, to see what they were doing. Now, they took 40, The another drawback to the study is that it was a small study. So it's 43 healthy, non-obese, female and male subjects on a plant-based diet for at least five years. And the other group was 45 non-obese, female and male subjects on an omnivore diet or the standard American diet for at least five years. So that part was pretty good. And the obese, non-obese part is really important. So when they look at people who are standard American diet compared to vegan, one of the things that pops out is that the standard American diet tends to have higher bone density. Now, why is that? Well, you look at the average weight in that study, the body weight is much higher. Remember, I just talked to you about the more weight you carry, the stronger the gravitational pull, the more you weigh, the more pull on the bone, the more weight load on the bone, the more the body is going to respond by adding density to the bone. 
So overweight people actually have higher bone density and more fit and more lean people will have naturally lower density because of the weight that they're carrying. Now, this can be changed simply by exercising. That's the other fact. So changing to a, a, a low-fat, uh, whole food, plant-based diet can make you nice and lean, which would be great. But if you're not doing load-bearing exercises, resistance training, or something like this, then your body can actually start to lose, uh, lose bone structure. And it can lose a little muscle too as well. But that's very important. So this study really points this out nicely. So let's go dive into the study, the results. So in the vegan group, the uh, what's called trabecular and cortical structures, these are the lattice work that's inside the bones, the osteocalcin uh, produced web-like structures in the bones. So that webbing is what gives bones their strength. That structure was altered compared to omnivores. And I'm going to read this verbatim right from the study. Vegans not reporting resistance training had diminished bone microarchitecture compared to omnivores that were also not weight training. So by eating a high animal diet, their body stored more calcium because there's can be a lot more calcium in the foods they eat if they're eating dairy and, and some animal products too as well. They're just consuming a much higher amount of calcium and the bone is acting as a storage reservoir for calcium. So naturally, they would actually have a little bit higher bone density. Now, this is where the study gets interesting and why I think this is such an important message about exercise. Okay, in the vegans and omnivores reporting resistance training, bone structure was similar. So, if you are the same body weight, but you're eating animal products, your bone density is going to be a little bit higher because your calcium intake is probably a little bit higher and it's storing the calcium. But if you add resistance training, you're at the same level as an omnivore. No difference. That's what the study is showing, that resistance training is the equalizer for a high calcium animal-based diet. So it's interesting, and I'll, I'll read this right in here. In both groups, a small number of correlations between nutrient intake and microarchitecture was there, but they were non-significant. Um, they didn't really matter, and they didn't show a pattern. So there's naturally different fluctuations based on what pe different people were eating. Their intakes were going to be similar, but it didn't make an, a significant difference in that. So it wasn't what they were consuming that was actually making the difference. It was the amount, it was the amount of resistance training that was really making the difference. Now, um, so the conclusions say these differences were attenuated by subgroups reporting resistance training. So when both groups exercised, bone density was the same. When they both groups didn't exercise, omnivores had an advantage. This is one of the reasons why I am always saying plant-based diet plus exercise. I do not suggest and do not believe that most people should be just saying, oh, it's diet and diet's the only important. Exercise is not important. It is vitally important. It's vitally important to maintain blood pressure. It's vitally important to maintain metabolism. It's, it's a form of detoxification. It increases blood flow. It, it normalizes blood pressure. It, it strengthens bone tissues. There's so many different benefits for resistance style training of exercise. Now, resistance can be bands. It can be body weight. It can be lots of different things, but there has to be some resistance to the training of it. And um, weights are the most popular uh, way about doing that and the most accessible for most people. Anybody can buy a couple of uh, sets of dumbbells and, and get a full body workout right at home. You don't need to go to a gym. You don't have to go to a gym. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put this question up there. What do you think of uh, blood flow? Thank you, Raymond, uh, again, for watching and thank you for your questions. What do you think of blood flow resistance weight training? It's uh, supposed to be good results with lighter weights, especially for elder, elderly people. Yeah, so there are some interesting studies on using cuffs uh, or, or bands, which are 
um, what this is talking about is, is using pressure. So when you actually put pressure on the outside of the body, you are mimicking what happens when you exercise vigorously, okay? Um, so when you exercise vigorously, you can get a big pump, right? And that pump engorges and puts pressure on the muscle. That pressure then causes cell signaling to stimulate muscle growth, muscle repair, muscle strengthening, and bone too as well. Now you can artificially simulate this just by putting pressure like a wrap around the arm that puts pressure, pressure wraps. Uh, some people use them on their feet for diabetics for um, because the, to prevent for the varicose veins and things like this. But athletes are now using this, putting the pressure cuffs on the outside so that when they're training, they're simulating that pressure environment that you get from somebody working out with large intensity and getting the big full pump. That pump is creating that internal pressure, but you can artificially simulate it by doing the cuffs. Now, as uh, Raymond suggested, this might be a good way for elderly people if they're especially in a fragile state or they have a lifelong of, 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 of a bad diet and are not in a good place to do heavy lifting or strenuous exercise and need to start out very mild and slow. Yeah, this can, is a nice uh, little bit of a shortcut to get uh, help elderly or people who are just starting out simulate a vigorous workout without having to put that much stress on joints that may be uh, damaged or, or fragile or bones that might be fragile or muscle groups that are just starting out. So absolutely good question. And but for the for the person who isn't uh, physically challenged, who is healthy, who is uh, got some level of fitness and some level of strength, your best bet is just to do a vigorous workout. If you can, obviously you need to make sure your heart's in a good condition, your health is in good condition, and don't push yourself further than your body's ability. Don't risk the uh, risk of injury. Work with a personal trainer. Corinne Sutton, uh, my friend, is a great personal trainer for any of you who want to do that. Check our, out our ambassadors. We have several great athletes, plant-based athletes that can help guide you at whatever level you're at to get to that training level. But this is so important. The last part of this, the conclusions, in addition to a well-planned diet, progressive resistance training on a regular basis should be part of the vegan lifestyle. I couldn't agree more. That's why I'm always uh, suggesting that people, look, I'm 60 years of age, best shape of my life, and I'm doing this because the plant-based diet is helping with the recovery, helping accelerate nutrient uptake. Now, here's another thing, nutrient uptake. So there are two key nutrients that you need to consider um, for overall bone health. One is vitamin K2. Now, it used to be thought that um, plants only provide vitamin K1 and that you could only get vitamin K2 from animals. But where do vitamin K2 come from in animals? How do animals make vitamin K2? <laughs> Especially since we eat mostly plant eating animals. A cow that you eat beef, right, is <laughs> a vegan. They eat grass all day long. How do they get the vitamin K2? Same place that we do. That vitamin K1 goes in, goes into our gut microbiome, and then very specific bacteria that feed on fiber actually take and convert that vitamin K1 to vitamin K2, and then it gets absorbed in our system. So yes, there is no vitamin K2 in a diet unless you're doing fermented, fermented soy, fermented other drinks. That's what's happening. You're fermenting the vitamin K1 in soy by using bacteria outside the body, or you can use the fermentation tank that we're all born with and let the fermentation bacteria in our gut do that process just by giving it a good source of vitamin K1 and let those bacteria in our gut come up and convert it to vitamin K2. And then that vitamin K2 can store in our livers and our tissues and use it when our body wants to. Now, an interesting thing, when you work out, boom, when you stress the muscle, you actually release some osteocalcin. That's what makes that webbing in uh, from the bones, and it helps strengthen the muscles. So now you have this nice back and forth. You exercise 
and the bone releases osteocalcin into the bloodstream, which strengthens the muscles. And then your muscles are stronger so they can handle more weight. And as you add more weight, which is why I said progressive resistance training, adding a slightly bit more weight each time allows your body then the bones release the osteocalcin osteocalcin when you work out, which strengthens the muscles, which allows you to handle more weight, which allows you to stimulate more bone uptake of calcium. Now, it does require those two nutrients, and one of them is uh, vitamin D3. Now, I produce this vegan vitamin D3 because it's the first and only vegan D3 on the market to be from organic algae. Now, this is really cool because this is a 100% pure vegan D3. D3 all by itself, just colocosopherol, that the actual D3 that is found in humans, the actual D3 that we use to convert uh, to 25-OH. So this is what we need, and this is it in its pure state, in its organic state. And that's why I was so excited to find this vegan D3 um, because it's the first 100% uh, pure vegan D3 on the market <laughs> and the first organic one from organic algae. So organic, 100% pure. And the reason why I like 100% pure because uh, most of the other ones from mushrooms or lichen are actually not pure. They have impurities in them. It's because they have to extract them and the extraction process is not a purified process. So you could be getting some vitamin D2 in there. Now, vitamin D2 is actually shown to inhibit potentially or be less effective than vitamin D3. That's one when I found a pure D3. I was like, boom, that's going to be much more effective for people and it's organic. I wanted to be the first in the marketplace, and we were. The other is your vitamin K1 source. Clean green protein with lentine. Oh, my God. 1,100% of your vitamin K in it. That's 11 times more vitamin K that you need for the entire day in one little scoop of uh, clean green protein. Now you might say, Oh, is that too much? No, it's not too much. It's never too much. The body can wash it right out. It's water soluble vitamin K. The body will only convert in the gut enough to feed the body. So it's really cool that the body sends messages through the gut and cell signals and talks to the bacteria saying, Hey, produces some more vitamin K2. The bacteria will break down more of the K1, produce the vitamin K2. They have conversations back and forth with each other. They do this with many nutrients. They do it with iron. When there is too much iron, the liver produces a, a, a thing called hepcidin. Hepcidin then goes and signals our gut cells to say, hey, stop sending uh, any more iron in there. Then the bacteria in our gut will say, okay, great, no more iron. We'll stop breaking down the phytic acid and allow it to pass through so that iron that you don't need doesn't get absorbed into the system. Now, when you eat animal iron, it's free iron. So the bacteria are like, oh, I can't do anything with that. And it goes right into the bloodstream. They used to think that was a good thing. Now we know it can cause toxicity. That free iron can rust, oxidize. And when it oxidizes, it can form cancer-causing compounds like neutrosamines. This is why animal-based iron is far worse. Animal-based iron can cause many different types of cancers. It's been linked to diabetes. It's been linked to cardiovascular um, damaging uh, effects, whereas plant-based iron is bound to phytic acid. So it can't do that. And our bacteria will only break off that phytic acid. The phytic acid alone can go in and change the cancer cell back to a non-cancer cell. Check out my videos on vitamin K1, K2 conversion, all about that. Now, where do you get your calcium? Well, they showed in this study basically that the nutrient uptake wasn't a, a factor about how the bone strength was. What resistance training neutralized that effect. Basically, the nutrients are there, but you're not giving the bones reason to pull up those nutrients. Either you have way too much surplus, which is in an animal-based diet, so the bone says, oh, what the heck, we'll store more of the calcium in the bone, or you exercise and the bone will say, hey, let's pull more of those plant-based calcium into the bone and it is the same. Same as an omnivore diet, same as a plant-based diet if you exercise, if you use resistance training. 
That's why resistance training is so important. And when you can combine a healthy whole food plant-based diet with the right nutrients of vitamin K and D3, then you can get your bone in the optimal health while adding strength to as well. Remember that D3 is shown to increase muscle strength. Yes, good old vegan D3 increased muscle strength in a, in a human clinical study by 19%. Who would think D3 has got more muscles? But that's the case. It helps uh, if you have low T. It could be a vitamin D3. It strengthens the immune system. It strengthens bones and teeth. There's so many good things about it. And I suggest uh, to all of my friends, there are uh, three really important nutrients, four, actually four, uh, which is vitamin D3, uh, omega-3, uh, iodine, and vitamin B12. I think that's something that almost everyone should consider taking. You can always get your blood tests done. And if you're not getting it from your food, do not just pretend it's not a problem. Um, you're talking about your health. You want your health to be the best so that you can enjoy the life you were born to live. So there's a great study. Yes, it's a small study. Yes, it's an observational study. It has its limitations. But I like looking at all information, especially when these studies um, include vegans right in the study and look at comparative. And I like talking about what we're seeing and the differences and why it's so important to include exercise with your whole food plant-based diet. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this helpful. You can, along with this video and all the rest of the videos, check out my vitamin K video, check out my omega-3 video, check out my um, video on oxalates. Uh, here's another thing. So, you know, most people think, oh, what's the, one of the highest contents of calcium? Spinach. But then they say, oh, no, the oxalates in spinach, you're not going to absorb that calcium. Well, now we know otherwise. Check out my video on oxalates. And it'll show you that there's a really cool bacteria in the healthy gut systems, the microbiomes of high fiber consuming plant-based diet, folks. Okay, so when they looked at the oxalo oxalates, there's this bacteria in our gut in healthy plant-based people that is called oxalobacteria uh, formigenes. So oxalobacteria, oxalobacteria means it's a bacteria that eats oxalates. Okay, but why did the original study say, hey, wait a minute, oxalates can be a problem? It's because they were looking at omnivores, those eating a meat-based diet. When you eat a meat-based diet, your oxalobacteria go down. They drop significantly on it. So when they studied those doing the standard American diet or a meat-based diet, they said, oh, wait, you got too little of the oxalobacteria when they're on it. Now, those eating a plant-based diet, their oxalobacteria bacteria shot through the roof. Now they're munching away all that oxalate, and it's not a problem as much for those eating a plant-based diet. As a matter of fact, they found almost no correlation by those actually eating a high plant-based diet for oxalates and kidney stones. Kidney stones are calcium oxalate. So they thought, oh, well, that's where the oxalates are coming from. It's coming from the oxalates in our diet. Yes, but not if you're doing a plant-based diet and you have a healthy microbiome. They found that just by consuming antibiotics, which wipe out that oxalobacteria bacteria and drop it to almost nothing, that's when kidney stones surface the most. So it's the use of antibiotics that are actually causing that. And when you consume plant-based diet, that high fiber and high oxalates increases the amount of oxalobacteria that munch up all that oxalate and free up all that calcium iron that's in spinach, calcium and iron that's in spinach. So now you're getting the sources, but it's because we're eating those animal products that are causing that downward crash. That's why the previous study done on animal-based eaters is not good information because their microbiome is different from people on a plant-exclusive diet. Our microbiome shifts, the number of bacteria doing specific activities shifts, 
and increases in those in a plant-based diet because they eat fiber, they eat polyphenols, they eat oxalates only found in plants. So this is where they're getting the food. And when you feed those microbiome bacteria, they're going to increase. They're going to be more effective at serving the body and the functions that we do. This is one more piece of evidence showing us that human beings are herbivores because when we shift our diet, we shift the microbiome to a more favorable position with more of the good guys doing good things and removing the negative effects of a plant-based diet that was assumed when we looked at only the research on omnivores because omnivores had a much lower amount of those beneficial bacteria because they're eating plant uh, animal products that cause a big bile environment which suppresses the good bacteria and that's what the big difference is it's the eating of the animal products that is causing the problems causing the poor published studies when you find people on an exclusively plant-based diet with exercise just like we would be in nature that's where you can get the healthiest results and that's what i want for you i hope you enjoyed this one it's a small study and it's observational, but it's all good information. I don't like dismissing uh, categorically. There are uh, study snobs out there. Oh, this is too small. This is, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'll just ignore it. Well, why are you ignoring information? Take it with, it with its perspective, understand its limitations, but learn from everything. There's good information in these studies. There's good information in this research, even if it has limitations, even if it's just there to ask the deeper questions. But what about? Well, great, let's do another study on this. This is important. This study shows us some things that are very important. That exercise may be just as important as a, a great whole food plant-based diet and maintaining healthy bones. So get out there, get your plants on, and exercise. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining me.